G'day guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Wildcard. Thank you for being here and watching my content. I really do appreciate it. And uh, you are here because it's Tuesday and it's time to read the news. And what a great time it is to be a rugby fan with the Rugby World Cup just looming in the horizon. And the Six Nations is just a few full steps away. The world of rugby had a seismic news came out yesterday, Monday, Australian time. Sir Eddie... My dad, apparently, uh, has been reappointed as the head coach of the Wallabies with Dave Rennie being sacked for immediately. Uh, yeah, this was a bit of a shocking news for a lot of people because last week we reported Dave, Dave Rennie was in a training camp in the Gold Coast with the Wallabies, you know, preliminary squad. Uh, and uh, he literally addressed the media last week saying that Eddie Jones won't be part of his team go into the Rugby World Cup and there was there has been no talks between him and Eddie Jones uh, working together essentially and lo and behold of course they're not going to work together Eddie Jones is just straight up replacing Dave Rennie Dave Rennie is you know will be stepping down as the the I guess a, a coach with the worst record in the history of the Wallabies who has coached more than 30 games. Maybe I think there's be people that's obviously worse in shorter to, uh, shorter time frame. But yeah, he's uh, basically the worst. And he also last year was the worst since two, 1958 or something uh, of the Wallabies. So yeah, it was, you know, there, there's uh, you know a lot of things that didn't go right for the Wallabies. And it was a bit surprising because I thought the Wallabies was going to stick it out. But, you know, with Eddie Jones, such a huge... Uh, name on the table I think the Wallabies probably um, yeah probably made the right decision going forward and sure enough this has stirred up a lot of media a lot of interest uh, it has returned for the for the rugby in Australia apparently for the first time like ever oh by the way the uh, Australia Open is playing right now in Melbourne for the first time ever rugby was news ahead of tennis during you know Australia Open right like the biggest sporting event happening at the moment in Australia it's uh, overshadowed by the appointment of Eddie Jones to the Wallabies so yeah uh, pretty big stuff I'm very excited and obviously Eddie Jones the sir himself coming back to Australia has to bring a new catchphrase for all of us to put on our caps put on our walls you know put it on the ceiling so you can see it while you're in bed okay and uh, here's a new catchphrase Hopefully, can hear this. The rugby uh, and get the Wallabies winning again. Did you hear that? If you're not, he said, uh, the catchphrase is get the Wallabies winning again. I concur. Get the Wallabies winning again. Uh, obviously, Eddie Jones has been through some media last, you know, last 24 hours or so. He talked about uh, ahead of, you know, not just, you know, he's focusing on basically getting the Wallabies ready for the World Cup. Uh, as to the time frame, he thinks that, you know, we got like what nine months till the World Cup, uh, so he's he reckons that yeah it's plenty of t enough time for him to walk around, and also he there, there's some talks about him potentially wanting to adjust the 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 structure of the rugby Australia, which is really really important, which really has fallen apart from the, underneath. He has really just come out and stated that uh, Australian rugby has a lack of support in grassroots filtering up to the professional levels. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, this has been the structure for a very long time now. Uh, you know, in the so-called, before the professional era, this was good enough. You have, you know, kids finishing high school and, you know, doing well in your know, first 15 rugby. And you kind of just, you know, go into the, 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 the Reds academies, you go into the Waratahs academies, and then you basically transition straight into super rugby, essentially, if you're good enough. And if you're not good enough, you go to, you know, the club rugby, you play as an amateur, essentially, and you basically very, you know, you have to be really good in the amateur league to get your way up into the professionals. So that's kind of like how rugby has worked in Australia for a long time. There's a lack of, you know, even with the N, what do they call it, the NPC introduces, still there's a lack of, uh, there's a big gap between you know the the unprofessional you know the, the amateur and the professional levels there's and, and eddie jones has come out and stated that in, uh, in one of the interviews he kind of wanted like to funnel the fans through the club rugby more like boasting club rugby is like you know the randwick uh waverly to bolster the, uh, the the local clubs or maybe the brothers in in brisbane and then try to get the fans to, to support those clubs as you know as their local club and then filtering that up 
to the Waratahs as a state club sort of sort of seeing thing, and then the national team as the Wallabies. So the, and then that'll also increase the um, the talents coming through the ranks as well. So that's kind of like what Eddie Jones had talked about in terms of fixing the upcoming talent issues. But with the Rugby World Cup, he thinks he's good enough enough time, and uh, he's going to be yeah. He's going to be going forward to, to help win the Web Ellis Cup. So, obviously, Eddie Jones being assigned, there's a lot of talks from every, all around the world. Um, let's first have a look at this one here. Uh, yeah, so this is an article that basically talks about how he wants to build, like, a the club rugby up a little bit more. Obviously, the Kiwis, are, you know, has their own opinion. They always have got to go the opposite side. Uh, you know, the, the Kiwis has issued challenges for Eddie Jones to come and win the uh, or the win the the, the Bledisloe Cup at Eden Park again. Obviously, Eddie Jones has won the Bledisloe Cup. Uh, believe it or not, in 2002 and 2001, he did lose it in 2003, and the cup the cup hasn't returned to Australian soil ever since 2003. And obviously, the Wallabies has not won at Eden Park since 1960. 60 what? 60, 67, 67, I think. And, you know, time has moved on a lot. But, yeah, uh, that's a challenge that Eddie Jones needs to face. Uh, apparently, the, you know, all this talk about Eddie Jones come and win in a, uh, at uh, Eden Park. It's not going to happen this year, believe it or not, guys. It's a bit of a, you know, the Kiwis like to talk talk a lot of these, these you know, likes to run the mouth a little bit because they apparently the uh, Eden Park has been booked out for the women's game or something uh, as like a women's sevens tournament or something so it's already booked out so it, it can't happen at Eden Park this year so yeah we're happy to win the Blood of uh in another city uh maybe uh I don't know maybe Christchurch <laughs> hopefully and uh that'll be a good good start for for us but yeah obviously Tim Horan former Wallabies two-time winner and he's also the, in, on the commentary team for a lot of the news things set a little goal for Eddie Jones you know uh winning blood of the cup within two years that's very difficult but we'll see winning getting the rugby world cup semi-final uh, I think it's probably easier to get in the semi-final than winning blood of the cup in two years because you know the Wallabies has a pretty pretty easy run to the semi-finals to be to be frank uh, I feel like the Wallabies have to go to the finals to really justify like an improvement that was unexpected uh, and potentially winning it to, to justify like an unexpected because I feel like Dave Rennie would easily take in the Wallabies to the semi-finals. Uh, Lions tour win. Yes, this is a big one. We lost the last Lions tour 2-1. Two to one, So we need to, yeah, definitely have to fix that up. With Eddie Jones still got a couple of years to, to fix that up. And the Bledisloe Cup in two years, that's going to be very, very difficult. Probably the most difficult task ahead of the, ahead of Eddie Jones. Um, Eddie Jones is um, coaching upcoming ahead so obviously the uh for new zealand you know dave rennie is a kiwi there's a lot of backing for dave rennie and people felt like he was sacked unceremoniously uh Stephen donald came out Stephen donald a former all black kicked that winning goal in 2011 to win the game for the all blacks against france at eden park so he kind of came out and said that how you know he was a formerly uh, a, a player under Dave Rennie. How Dave Rennie has helped him improve, and also how he felt like Dave Rennie, the way he felt like the way the wall, the, the Australian rugby treats the New Zealand coaches. He specifically said New Zealand coaches much worse because the fact that they're like you know we hate we hate Kiwis apparently. So he, he's saying that, and as as a result, he's saying that. A warning to all the New Zealand coaches: Don't go coach the Wallabies, or the evil Australians will get you. Donald, in case you haven't been watching, uh, we treat all of our coaches equally shite, okay? Uh, we, we treated, we, we, we sacked Eddie Jones in 2005, we sacked everybody, okay? We sacked, um, uh, what is it, Michael Checker, we didn't sack him actually. We treated all of our coaches equally back, in case you haven't noticed, but yeah, he somehow thinks that it's just against the Kiwi coaches. I mean, if, if you're really gonna be honest, um, Stephen Donald, the way you guys treat your own coaches is not really that good either. So, uh, not everyone's jumping on to try to, you know, take the um, All Blacks coaching role from Ian Foster at the moment. So, yeah, um, maybe have a look at your your own state of the affair first. So, yeah, let's have a go through some I mean, quick short timeline for Dave Rennie's career. Uh, I mean, there, he has been hamstringed a lot by the lack of availability to, you know, to key players. He hasn't really had a consistent team for uh, for the Wallabies for his tenure. But
but regardless, you know, it is what it is. He, he hasn't really, uh, I did feel like he hasn't really done enough. And, and also, yeah, and anyway, regardless, let's have a look at Tony Aldo. So I think the best part of his, his coaching maybe happened on day one, essentially the first test match against New Zealand. Uh, this was in Wellington, it was a draw, and this was just an absolutely spectacular uh, match, probably one of the best Bloodless Cup matches I've seen in, you know, in, in many, many, many years, probably decades. Uh, just the competitiveness and the, the willingness for both teams to win in extra time. And the game went over like, what, eight minutes or something past the 80th minute. And uh, nobody wanted to end the game because everybody wanted to win this one. So this, that's, that was a really, really opening for Day Rennie. A lot of promise. Uh, and then they, and then they, he went on, kind of like lost a few games. Uh, and then he, he kind of went on to recall Quake Cooper, a big decision. And that was, you know, f first time allowing uh, an Australian coach to, to, to select somebody from overseas. So he was allowed to select, to break the sort of the breaking of the the Guido's law, uh, allowing Quake Cooper to come back and play um, after the, uh, uh, yeah, after losing pretty badly to to the All Blacks. I remember, yeah, Lo Nola Seo was a bit too young and a bit too fresh to be put into the fold against the All Blacks and really had a struggle. But anyway, he recalled Quake Cooper and won five games in a row, two games against the Springboks at home. Um, but yeah, still quite quite a big achievement against the world champions, against the Springboks. Uh, and following that, um, the he yeah, following that he um, the Quake Cooper and Samuel Kurebi left. He went on to the sprint tour and really got yeah lost the sprint tour quite convincingly in 2021 to England, to Wales, and Scotland. And then he, um, in the uh, second year of his running in 2022, again, in July, England came here with a team with quite a few key injuries. Um, Australia lost 2-1, winning the first test, and then following that, losing two tests in a row. Uh, I thought Australia had a much better team because, you know, this was the start of the season. There, was some, there were some injuries, but really not to the extent that they should be losing to a run-down England team. That Eddie Jones brought, so yeah, that was the the, the start of the kind of like uh, the sign that you know that that felt like the, the, the that, that's kind of like start of the the cracks started to show for Dave Rennie's um, uh, Wallabies and Quake Cooper then joined the Wallabies again in hoping to turn things around, but he was injured before the kickoff against Argentina, and then yeah, the Wallabies getting flogged by Argentina, never never in my life. Would I, did I ever think that the Wallabies was going to get flogged by Argentina? I thought Argentina could upset the Wallabies. I never thought I would see that. And then to lose, uh, they did win one game against the Springboks and then losing to the All Blacks. Back-to-back -back games, really close to, to say the, the first game, but still um, a loss is a loss. And then going to November again, the Wallabies has lost very close games. Uh, only winning against Scotland, uh, losing against... Uh, what is it? France very close losing against Ireland very close. Uh, you might say that's a good achievement uh, But yeah, you still you know a loss is it's it's yeah, it's not really You know uh, what when if you keep losing these close matches it comes down to not just a uh, bad luck Right if you keep rolling the dice and it ends up uh, on, on you keep flipping the coin and ends up on the face down It's just not really if, if one game. Yeah, but if you keep losing these tie games uh, again, this shows something is you know lacking in the coaching, lacking in the way of game management. Uh, and then I think finally the nail in the coffin is losing to Italy. Just the arrogance of the the, the coaching staff putting some putting Stephen Donald on. Is it Stephen Donald? Donaldson, sorry, Donaldson on for Lola Seo. Uh, really showed the lack of yeah management experience, maybe management error, arrogance, whatever you call it. Uh, and then they did finish up with a win. Comeback win against Wales was looking pretty dire, but yeah, wasn't good enough. Finish off the year with, again, the worst, um, one of the worst years in history ever of the Wallabies. Uh, overall, Dave Rennie's win rate is only 38%. Yeah, moving on now. So yes, S Steve Bothwick has announced the squad for England going into the Six Nations this year. And... So yeah, I, I was really curious of like the selections difference. There are some minor differences, but I feel like this is very largely what Eddie Jones probably could have selected anyway. But yeah, so um, obviously the big there's some some big winners, and we'll have a look at the people the losers that missed out. The big winner is obviously Elliot Daly. I did watch a game where he scored like three tries, 
in like what 10 minutes in the in the champions champions cup so he is definitely back in form but last year in the six nations daily was absolutely atrocious he was unbelievably bad he only had to come off the bench for about 20 minutes and uh, he couldn't make a tackle in in, in 20 minutes uh, and it was really bad so is, is that going to be him again this year we have to wait and see i, I did feel like based on his club performances he could justify um a selection but then again international test is a different story and we shall see how that goes dan cole uh 35 year old prop gets called out uh, i do think that it, uh, the, this is an area that bothway has identified that the england scrum isn't so uh, as good as they probably would like it to be and ben earl the flanker gets called in for England due to probably injury to Tom Curry, more or less like uh, the case. But let's have a look at some of the players that actually missed out. Uh, probably the ones that we, yeah, more, more or less have to say. So first up, Jack Noll. This is the one that really surprised me. I thought Jack Noll is expe exceptionally well for England. Uh, a lot of really good, like, run, overall stats, run minutes. Maybe his form in clubs hasn't been that great due to injuries or whatnot. But yeah, Jack Noll misses out for England selection. Uh, he was one of the favorites for Eddie Jones. Johnny May, again, not a, not a favorite for Eddie Jones. He misses out. Uh, but Johnny May has not been informed for a very, very long time. So I think Eddie Jones did have him on the field uh, in November test. Let's try to get him back in, in shape. But yeah, just really wasn't delivering for Eddie Jones. Uh, Billy Vinipola, another guy who showed some form in July against Australia, but really didn't de deliver again. A lot of disciplinary errors for Eddie Jones in November let him down a little bit uh he is out i'm not surprised alex coles is out hugh tizard is out val uh rapava ruskins is out david R ribbons is out guy porter uh a center i thought was i thought he probably deserved uh, another shot to replace mano tuilangi because i thought tuilangi was really really bad in november test as well another eddie jones go-to guy but tuilangi keeps his spot and guy porter is out uh, guy porter is a really good out center the game where england won convincingly against japan in november test was with guy porter in outside center in place of mano tui Langing. so i thought porter probably deserved another shot and yeah surprising that tui Langi kept his spot because i thought he was really really poor uh joe thokana singer get it's out again another experimental guy he was really kind of really good against um argentina but they still lost i didn't think it was his fault he did do what he was kind of like assigned to do, make line breaks, being a good ball runner. So I felt like Joe Tokuna Singer could should, should probably retain in the spot, give you a bit more experience. Uh, George Furbank is out. Um, so these are kind of the names that missed out Joe, uh, Bothwick's selection. Obviously, injury looms for England as well. Uh, Tom Curry, one of the biggest names, is out. Luke Houndiki is injured as well. He's He might be able to play in the uh second or maybe his third test going in like he might come back midway in the six nations henry arundel is out due to injury jack singleton and rafi quirk is out so uh overall let's quickly go through the england squad and let's see um let's have a look at some of the selections that we haven't mentioned yet so in the forwards ollie cheson dan cole ben curry alex don Brown returns from injury quite quite good he played for um for the who, who uh, he plays for the uh harlequins and I, I did watch a game i thought he, he got like he got sent off for a yellow card um but yeah we shall see how it goes um ben earls ellis genge jamie george joe hayes johnny hill uh yeah i i didn't think I, yeah i thought johnny hill really let eddie jones down as well in november actually let's stop calling it letting eddie jones down let england down uh in november especially against the Springboks. Um, surprise is selected. Nick Isakev is uh, selected again. Maori Toje, uh, for sure. Courtney Laws was injured in the November, which was a really important part to, to England as well. He was actually supposed to be the captain uh, for England in November, and but he was due to a concussion. He wasn't able to play. So yeah, that's a, that was a huge loss for Eddie Jones. Lewis Lutlam uh, gets, again, uh, gets called. It's Lewis Lutlam. Next up, George Mc. Gigan, McGeehan, anyway, Bevan Rod gets called back into the squad, uh, Bevan, I thought he was really good for the Sharks, Sales Sharks, I watched it again where he, he had to come home early due to an injury, and uh, was this, yeah, one of the championship, championship games, and he, yeah, the scrum looked really good, so Bevan, uh, 
definitely a good scrummager, but in terms of his defense, I'm um, not too sure. So Sam Simmons stays in this fold. Kyle Sinclair gets caught in again. McIlvin and Pola, Jack Walker and Jack Willis finish off the forwards. In the back line, Elliot Daly being returned. Oren Farrell returns, cap returns and retains the captaincy for England. So there was a bit of a controversy. Oren Farrell was supposed to be suspended due to a high tackle, um, but he, his suspension will be shortened to three weeks instead of four, making him eligible to play against Scotland due to a, um, he has to do like one of the tackling training sessions to reduce it down to, to four. And it was really good because Farrell gets three weeks off going into the um, going into the first round. And it'd be interesting to see where where Bothwick will put Farrell at 12, where he's going to put him at 10 or maybe put him at bench. So we shall see what's going to happen there. Uh, Tommy Freeman uh, is next. Ollie Hassel Collins is next. Uh, Dan Kelly, Max Malins, Joe Merchant. Uh, Joe Merchant was saying that he's, he's actually contracted to go to France. So I, th I thought Joe Merchant has done really well for Eddie Jones last year in the Six Nations. He wasn't selected at all uh, in the November test. I did think that Joe Merchant deserved that shot following his performance uh, in the Six Nations. I thought it was quite decent. Like It was horrendous uh, in the Six Nations for the England. And Joe Merchant did was one of the standouts that actually played quite well. Uh, so yeah, he gets another shot. Alex Mitchell, uh, Caden Murley, Henry Slade gets... Uh, so Henry Slade as well, he could potentially be facing uh, suspension. He might not be able to play um, some of the Six Nation games uh, because of a high tackle that happened on the weekend. But the his team will be challenging... We'll go through this article in a sec. We'll be challenging the, uh, the high tackle on... What is it? Curly Alinsa against the, uh, against the Bulls. So they will be challenging that. So hopefully he will be um, okay to play. Uh, Finn Smith and Marcus Smith. Uh, Marcus had a bit of injury as well. He just returned to the fold. Freddie Stewart, uh, again, one of the outstanding players for the Leinster Tigers. Uh, Bothwick would know that. Marlo Tuilangi, uh, depends on his form. i honestly surprised to see him in the team. Uh, if he gets to start, we'll have to see how he goes. I really don't think that he was in form, at least in November. Maybe he was, he'll be much better following a bit more time in the club. Uh, Jack Van Poivier and Ben Youngs, both the Tigers. Fly, uh, halfbacks get selected uh, once again. So yeah, uh, this is the setup for the England squad. Who's going to be at 12? Who's going to be at 10? Uh, is probably going to be the biggest question going into into the uh, the Six Nations. And uh, yeah, we have to wait and see what Bothwick decides to do. So yeah, like we just mentioned, Owen Farrell was cited for a high tackle. And uh, he's got a four-week suspension, but it will be reduced, reduced down to three if he gets if it takes a tackling training course. So and also, yeah, Henry Slade, we just mentioned as well, he has been a red carded uh, following the, um, the his team's loss to the Bulls, a high tackle on Curdy Alensa. So there will challenge this decision because, as you can see here, the high tackle did initially contact to the shoulder, and then Alensa kind of like ducked himself down into the head so it's not really looking like he's going to be suspended if at all so he should be okay to um to play based on the evidence that's provided so far but anyway let's move on from england now so steve hansen has come out he's he's been on the uh, talking to a lot of media in these times uh has talked about some issues that he thinks that the rugby the world rugby should tidy up going into the rugby world cup two issues that he raised uh, so far one he talked about the rack height the, there's an issue where players are cleaning people out and making contact with the head especially if the defend if the player that's jackling over the ball the defending player is really low it's too difficult to kind of like clean them out the only way to do it is to roll to do like a gator roll um you know, to do a gator roll or like a turtle roll, what's called like a turtle roll, uh, which is, I mean, it's, it's it's definitely not like impossible to clean out without hitting them in the head. But he maybe he talked about how that's just you know making the game almost uncontestable at the breakdown. Uh, so he feel like maybe there needs to be a change of the rules being looked at, how that rock needs to be interpreted, and maybe there needs to be a body height. Uh, limits on the jackler sort of thing and uh, yeah so he talked about that and the second thing issues that he talked about that needs to be he thinks that needs to be clarified going into the rugby world cup is the referee interference he felt like there's too much stoppage by the referee too much interference uh, i think this kind of ties into the issue that he had before with the rocks people getting hit in the head if the if the referee on the field didn't see an issue the tmo should be removed from making the decision unless being requested uh, and also the TMO should only assert themselves into situations where there is 
um, a clear and obvious issue that needs to be addressed. And yeah, so so yes, yeah, it, it should be really obvious something bad happened for the TMO to look at. Other than that, the TMO should only look at stuff that's been requested by the referee. And if the referee misses something, bad luck. It's just the way it is. Keep the game playing. And if there is a height tackle or something that's missed out, they'll have a look at it uh, on report later on. I think that's probably the best way to go about some of these things uh, Stephen Hansen is talking about. Uh, anyway, next up, the... DCMS, which is the Digital Culture, Media and Sports uh, Committee in England, has once again raised some red flags re with regarding to the financial situations of the Rugby Football Union and its Premiership Rugby Clubs. As we know that the Leinster Tigers, not Leinster Tigers, the uh, Worcester Warriors and the Wasps, the London Wasps, has already gone under. I think Wasps has been rescued now by some big bailout money, but two clubs going bankrupt and the... Um, the DCMCS has come out and basically warned that currently the clubs are suffering an annual loss of four million pounds per club, and he thinks that Bill Sweeney, that Bill Sweeney's plan to just in, to to increase revenue is not enough to cover the loss at the moment. So a lot of other clubs could be facing uh, financial troubles, and I think a few weeks ago we did look at some of the clubs. That, that they did list the club as well that had the, the biggest debt. So yeah, with continued losses to some of these, um, to to uh, continue losses to some of these clubs, uh, we yeah, there, there's, there could be danger of more clubs going under. And this being a call by the DCMS to to Bill Sweeney to address the issue, to come out with a better plan, to um, to yeah, to patch up the sinking ship essentially. So yeah, uh, next up, Charlie Gambles is on the verge of potentially becoming a wallaby he is obviously um a uh, kiwi he's grew up in in in, in, in new zealand he can through the system he came over to australia uh, i think like five years ago and he's played for the waratahs and he's been really good for the waratahs um last year and the wallabies really do need an extra another like breakdown special like in the flank flanker positions so if charlie gamble can make it for the wallabies it's a huge boost to the wallabies side uh, because at the moment the Wallabies are just playing a lock in Jet Holloway basically at the blindside position So having another specialist flanker breakdown specialist flanker is really 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 good So yeah, Charlie Gamble obviously I'm guessing he has to do the citizenship test uh, Charlie just one thing to remember with the citizenship test uh, If they ask you is it okay to 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 uh, to to beat up your spouse after the All Blacks gets eliminated from the Rugby World Cup here in Australia, the answer is no, okay? It's not okay to do that in Australia. Just make sure you remember that for the citizenship test, okay, Charlie? Uh, otherwise, yeah, you're not going to be able to play for the Wallabies, unfortunately. Just remember that. It's different here in Australia. Uh, it's not okay to beat up your spouse after the All Blacks lose. So, yes, make sure you remember that uh, as the correct answer. Next up, Bodie Retallick has left New Zealand Rugby. Uh, he is signed a three-year deal to Japan, uh, to the Kobe Steelers, and uh, he will be leaving at the end of the Rugby World Cup. And one of the uh, best locks, basically, yeah, could be in the history of the uh, the All Blacks. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> there was a, a interesting incident on the weekend. Uh, referee Matthew Reynald decided to waste everybody's time. Right? He decided to waste everybody's time, and uh, he apparently was cramping in altitude in South Africa under the hot heat. And decided to uh, to exit, <laughs> to eject himself out of the game and replace and got the replacement, got the uh, a replacement referee to finish off the match. I uh, 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 just in 51 minutes into the game, so just at the start of the second half, uh, he's had a calf cramp issues. So he literally told the players that he can't play anymore, guys. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a problem with my hamstring. So uh, so we just so he changed the referee, and as he was walking off the field, he was caught saying. I'm too old. Just wasting everybody's time, mate. Waste time wasting. Yellow card him. Yellow card him, okay? Yellow card this guy. Wasting time. Uh, anyway, moving on. In Scotland, Tui Polutu extends his time in Glasgow. He has been exceptionally well, playing exceptionally well for, the, uh, for, for Scotland and for Glasgow. So, yeah, really, that's, 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 that's what it is. I'm, I'm actually really excited to see him combination once again with Finn Russell, which was extremely good. In the November test against um, 
and this bug on my wall in case if you wonder <laughs> why i'm keeping looking up there um it was ex extremely good in the november test um against the all Blacks and argentina so i really wanted to see how he's gonna go and if they want to beat england in that first test match uh they will have to live have to make sure that he is in form to your um former australian so anyway marco zuloma pimpi is cited for a potential eye gouge uh following that win in durban against uh who was it yeah bordeaux biggles and uh yeah potentially we'll see how that goes but he is he is cited uh george north uh returns to the fold uh has made a comeback for his injury for the six nations and uh yeah his form in the november test wasn't that great to be honest so i wouldn't call this a huge boost to warren gatlin's side but we shall see and finally uh Hawals, is how you say his name was you know charged with assault i think basically for stealing an assault or something in 2014 uh he was supposed to be in court for this incident and uh he was i think last week and he didn't appear in court and the judge basically said that uh he needs to be here and they reschedule the court um the court hearings for after the six nations but anyway yeah he's gonna be in court for that he might um yeah it is what it is and that's the news for last week guys thanks for watching 31 minutes and um have fun i'll see you guys later cheers